One of the largest religious gatherings in the world is underway now in Saudi Arabia. Millions of Muslims are taking part in the annual Hajj pilgrimage in the holy city of Mecca. And with Saudi Arabia as well as Iran normalizing ties, there is a new wave of Iranians making the journey. And that is good news for business. Ashan Kevani reports. In the seven years when Iran and Saudi Arabia had no political relations, the number of Iranians taking part in the Hajj pilgrimage declined substantially. During the COVID pandemic, Saudi Arabia banned international visitors from attending the Hajj and Umrah pilgrimages. Iran always has a large number of applicants to attend the annual Hajj ceremony, which takes place in the last month of the Islamic lunar calendar. Besides, many Iranians are also eager to try the Umrah, which is a pilgrimage to Mecca that can be undertaken at any time of the year. Prior to 2016, as many as half a million Iranians would travel to Saudi Arabia every year to visit the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. The absence of Iranian pilgrims from the Hajj is estimated to have deprived Saudi Arabia of more than $1.3 billion in annual revenue. The economic impact was also felt in Iran's Hajj tourism sector. The closure of embassies for eight years forced hundreds of Hajj travel agencies across Iran to shut down or suspend their activities. Now we hope our guild can recover after the reopening of embassies and more demand for Hajj. The normalization of ties between Iran and Saudi Arabia earlier this year is likely to ease travel with more direct flights expected between the two countries. Although Saudi Arabia is yet to officially reopen its embassy in Tehran, Iranian pilgrims can apply online for visas to attend the Hajj and smaller Umrah pilgrimage to Mecca. To have our visas for the Hajj pilgrimage, only three days to fly to Mecca. Saudi Arabia has accelerated the process of issuing visas. After the embassies were reopened, we had to wait a shorter amount of time with lower expenses. The normalization of ties between Iran and Saudi Arabia can definitely facilitate the visa process for the Hajj pilgrimage. Besides, Iran's consulate in Jeddah is a source of assurance for the Iranian pilgrims in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has allocated 1.2 million seats for pilgrims this year. Some 90,000 Iranian nationals are set to take part in the Hajj, which begins in late June. Many more are expected to travel to Saudi Arabia for the Umrah pilgrimage from July. Ehsan Keivani, CGTN, Tehran. Well, authorities in the kingdom say more than 1.6 million pilgrims have already arised as of Sunday. That is despite rising inflation around the world, which has hiked the prices of flights, food, as well as accommodation. But it is reported that a few countries have not yet filled their quota of pilgrims this year, a sign that high prices may be taking their toll as demand usually outstrips the number of pilgrimage spots many times over. Before the pandemic, back in 2019, Saudi Arabia earned about $12 billion from the millions of pilgrims that visited both the Hajj and Umrah. Okay, to talk more about the role that inflation is playing in this important pilgrimage. We're joined by Ali Al Ahmed. He is the director of the Institute for Gulf Affairs here in Washington, D.C., and an expert on Saudi Arabia political affairs as well. Thank you very much for joining us, Ali. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much to you. you, you here in the U.S., you really don't hear much about Hajj, do you? Uh, no, you know, Muslim communities are spread across the United States, and uh, the, uh, uh, the Muslim presence in American news is very limited, especially in the past few years. Uh, so kind of bring us up to speed where we are now. The pilgrimage is underway, and as we mentioned, it, it, it never has trouble filling all those slots. What are the ex expectations for this year now that the pandemic has really kind of lifted the cloud uh, globally? Uh, well, there is going to be a lot of people who want to perform Hajj from inside and outside the country, and uh, the sort of the pandemic years or restrictions uh, have made people delay those uh, plans, uh, adding to the pressure of, of people. Uh, we must realize that it is very hard uh, to go to make Hajj, even mm -hmm. if you are able. Uh, there are uh, over 1.5 billion Muslims, and the Hajj cannot take more than 3 million, maybe a little bit more. And that creates a lot of demand, a lot of pressure, 
uh, and the government to accept uh, pilgrims from around the world. Yeah, I certainly don't want to talk about, solely talk about the business aspect of, of all this. To a global audience, explain why it is important, really uh, mandatory, if you will, that Muslims do uh, make Hajj, do go to Saudi Arabia, and how does the quota system work? Well, the uh, Hajj is one of the principal worship uh, and practices of Muslims. Uh, it does not come before prayer or fasting, but many people have made it. Imagine a hundred years ago, people from uh, from Indonesia would travel to Mecca on boats and spend months uh, risking their lives, and many probably perished to try to make that trip. So now, with planes and ease of access, more people are uh, hoping to get there. Uh, Islam allowed people to say you can, you should make Hajj if you are able. Mm. And most Muslim will not actually make Hajj because, again, the math doesn't work. Uh, and the quota system is based on the population of each country. The Saudi government made that smart decision actually to restrict uh, each country, even its own, uh, based on the population. Uh, uh, and uh, because it's not possible, it's not feasible to allow everybody to come. Uh, let's talk about the average cost of the pilgrimage. How has it changed really in the last um, four years? And does the economic aspect of this, does it really come into play when an individual decides to make that trip to Mecca? It, it is a financial. Uh, most Muslims are not going to be able to make the Hajj because it's too expensive. Hajj is now much more uh, comfortable but it's much less affordable. Uh, you can have packages per person that runs up to $50,000 wow. because now, unlike f 10 years ago, for example, you have uh, top of the line hotels mm -hmm. uh, that are five stars and even higher. You know, before uh, people who go to Hajj find themselves living in tents or uh, on the curb. And that's, that is something that the Saudi government was able to basically stop. Uh, now the Hajj rank, the lowest, and just for the Hajj, you know, because there are other stuff go, that goes with it, sure. from five thousand dollars to fifty. The lowest is thirty-five thousand, which bars a lot of people, even in the Middle East, in Jordan or Lebanon or Iraq, from from going because it is too expensive. But luckily, their governments also pitch in to uh, to help uh, organize uh, and bring the cost down. But the Saudi government has in invested and built a lot of expensive hotels. And they and the people who wish to stay, they must pay the price. Mm. Um, Ali, also, in following this over the years, I remember uh, seeing people trampled. And that, of course, uh, deals with the tents that you talked about. How was that decision made to basically stop people from camping, uh, coming in on a shoestring budget? And uh, what has it done to the whole experience? Well, the, the issue of the safety, you know, I have to, uh, wrote about this before. Unfortunately, Mecca and the Hajj has been the, um, the most deadly uh, uh, place uh, anywhere in the world in terms of, uh, you know, the holiest, sure. the most dangerous, holiest city and surrounding area it was, is Mecca, uh, with, with a lot of people dying in these uh, tragic accidents, with also tent fires. But mm. the, the Mina part, the, the, there should be tents. That's part of the uh, tradition. The, I think the problem has been always uh, emphasis on security uh, rather than organization. And that's something I hope to write about in the near future, that you can take uh, countries like China and their massive you know, population, and they're able to organize massive events, not with using security forces, but using actually management cores that, that are uh, able to uh, control crowds and organize people. And I think there has been a lot of development in terms of using apps and, mm. and technology now, but we are still having a lot of uh, uh, places in terms of the culture of how uh, we, the Hajj is run, and that hopefully will change in the near future. Ali Ahmed, uh, Ali Al Ahmed, I want to look for your article when it comes out uh, on this. As always, thanks very much for your insight. It certainly okay. is eye-opening, especially for a lot of people here in the United States. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much for having me.